Uh, we have just at that moment an exhibition which is very exceptional because um, it's the first time that the Colosseum of Rome is giving uh, some very important parts of the Colosseum outside of Rome, outside of Italy, to a foreign country. And so we are very happy to, uh, to be uh, the first ones who can show it and afterwards it will continue, it will go to Frankfurt and on, on Main and perhaps somewhere else, we will see. Um, to, to discuss about it and to get to the, to the theme why gladiators existed, uh, we have to go a little bit back and I wanted to show you that uh, it's normal that gladiators didn't come suddenly as a kind of, for us, very strange sport, uh, but there was a development. And there we have to go back first to the Greek games. It might be astonishing for, perhaps for you uh, to begin with the Greek games, because uh, in difference to the gladiator fights, we think the Greek games are very peaceful. But I will show you in the development that uh, there are also elements which are very cruel. And so that, uh, the change coming to gladiators are not so surprisingly. So first to introduce and to come to the Greek uh, games, you have to imagine um, in the development of uh, Greek games who really were the first to invent it to have professional games. Um, in the development uh, at the end, uh, we know that nearly each Greek city had games on uh, its own. We always have in mind the Olympic games, uh, so the games from Olympia, but uh, nearly each city had the kind of games. And so now uh, we know already from the 4th, 3rd century onwards really each city who could afford it had his own games. And nowadays we know about uh, over 300 cities which organize games surely. So you have to imagine it's like, uh, like to play uh, tennis and to have uh, tennis competitions over the world. So over the Greek world you had games. And uh, there have been also a kind of grand slam already in antiquities um, from the 6th century onwards. Uh, the grand slam, if you like to compare it with uh, tennis, was Olympia, sure, the Olympic Games. Um, then Delphi, Isthmus from near Corinth and Nemea. So if you won in these four big games, you were very, very famous. And uh, the Athenians also tried to have uh, also their special games, the Panathenetic games, but they were not uh, considered as the four most important games. Only for us they are very important because we have a lot of ceramics, um, Attic ceramics who are specially showing the games at Athens. Um, the famous Olympic Games have several competition sections and it's important to see, to look at them because then you see already there have been some kind of games which were not so peaceful, like wrestling, boxing, also Pankration, which was a very, um, it was a combination of all right fights and there was really everything allowed to fight each other except spitting, <laughs> uh, so using your teeth and crushing eyes. But if not, you could do everything. Then there have been also some peaceful uh, um, parts uh, we always consider as Olympic things, running in three different distances. Um, so the short distance, about 190 meters. Uh, the double short distance, which had 380 meters. And long distance over uh, 220 or 24 states, it depended on the times, so, which is about 300, uh, 3,845 or 4,614 meters. And there have been also the run with weapons to remember uh, the, war, uh, the war periods. Originally, with, uh, you know, this war running was with uh, helmet, greaves and shield. Later on, only with the, sh with the shield. Since there have been the pentathlon, so five fights. 
you say you could say your discus, shoveling, long jump, short distance running, and wrestling again. So in most of if you and then you had riding and chariot races. Also chariot races were very dangerous for life. So uh, if you see all this and you consider now what happened in the Olympic Games, there have been uh, uh, several several uh, parts or disciplines where were very dangerous also for, for the health and for life. The winner was on, uh, honored with a laurel branch, branch, not more do we think about it, but uh, the people who won, they got a lot of things. Not by, by in, the, in Olympia, but by the town, the city, who was honored by the winner. Uh, the conditions to be to pay to take part in the Olympic Games was to, you had to be Greek, and uh, there have been three different uh, stages of age uh, uh, which were considered. So you had sports for boys, teenagers, and men. Um, women uh, could only exceptionally take part uh, in the Olympic Games. Uh, by uh, a running race in honor of the deity, the goddess Hera. But this was only the only Greek uh, games we know where also women were allowed for one discipline. Uh, but they were not allowed to look at it. Victories, uh, victories uh, were very prestigious for the cities. And so the myth, uh, the myth of uh, the amateur was really only invented for the new Olympic Games in the 19th century by Coubertin. But nowadays we know Coubertin knew exactly that they have never been in the Olympic Games, the amateur. But he wanted to create a new kind of Olympic Games. And even knowing that it wasn't like this in antiquities, he said it was like this and so invented in this way the new Olympic Games uh, with the sense of showing that it's more peaceful. Victories, as I told you, were very prestigious for the cities and therefore uh, the winner get very high awards, like money, getting a house from the city, uh, free lunch for the whole life, no military service. So uh, somebody who win in, a, in the games got a lot of advantage and a lot of money, so also material things. And therefore, sure, they were entrained uh, all the time. They haven't been amateurs. They're working all the time only to be a, a good athlete and to be a winner. Uh, also, they got sometimes uh, statues and um, in the sanctuary with the one, and you have to imagine in Olympia there have been a lot of statues showing winners of the Olympic Games. So, have these Olympic Games really be harmless? And for example, we are coming now to, uh, I want to only show you two disciplines, and there you immediately realize that they haven't been harmless. For example, there have been uh, boxing, but boxing at this period was much more dangerous than nowadays. Uh, if you see, um, uh, they put uh, on the hands only very hard leather, but it was hard, hard leather, and uh, to, to protect hands, but also to box with us. So it was really very hard and very, very dangerous. And here you see a boxer and he's bleeding everywhere blood, blood is coming out. So he was injured, also his nose was destroyed. His ears, where blood is coming out, and also here. So the boxing at this period was very dangerous. And so if you speak of the Olympic Games when nothing happened, uh, it's a myth. So in antiquities also already the Greeks had fighting, which have been could be very cruel, and they could be uh, they could be injured very much or even die. Here another kind of representation we see it also. Here two boxers, and he's just uh, having uh, broken his nose, and uh, blood is coming out, but they continue to fight. They have never been, uh, uh, um, the fight was till somebody fall really down. Huh? 
and it could take uh, without any uh, pause, but it continued till the end. And even more surprising, um, if you come to the riding and chariot races, especially the chariot races, which were, were very famous at the Olympic Games, and very different um, disciplines. So I wrote you several on, on it. There have been quadrigas, so four, four horse races, two horse races, uh, two horse mules races, uh, and two uh, four hole races with folds. So different kind of races with two or three or four animals. And you have to imagine uh, this was very dangerous because you had uh, to turn. And when you come to the turning point, here's one of these turning points, and you come, go through, uh, and both and two are at the same level, and they have to turn, they come very close. And in this situation, very often it crashed. And if it crashed, uh, uh, so, so one who, who uh, got very big problems because uh, to, to be quicker on the horse, they always take the bridle not like this, but around the body. And therefore they had also a little kind of dagger if they come to the situation and if they just could uh, realize to, to get rid of the bridle, they could survive. If not, they were taken over by the horses. And a lot of people were taken over. So it was a very dangerous sport. And uh, the Romans even liked to show this situation. Here, for example, at Piazza Marina, you see just uh, two who were about to go to the, to the turning point, and one crashed. And he probably died also. So um, this uh, situation of saying, uh, Suddenly, the Romans came, have gladiators fight, and were very cruel. Uh, in contrast to the Greeks, who had only peaceful uh, Olympic Games, it's a myth. Here is another one of this. And you have to imagine also this myth again. Uh, for some chariot racers could earn a lot of money. I gave you here one of these examples. This uh, guy, Gaius Apuleius Diocles, won 1462 races in 24 years. And he earned 35,863,120 sesterces. And you have to imagine once as towards this period correlates to, correlates to about four euros. So if you multiply this, he, he won several 100 millions of euros in his career. So you could get enormously rich also in games. It's like <laughs> now it is with motor <laughs> sport. Another thing you have to imagine to understand why um, fighting could be cruel and nevertheless it did it uh, is uh, um, concerning the quality of life at this period at, uh, at the whole and the expectation of life. You have to imagine 80% uh, in Roman times uh, have been poor farmers uh, or very poor people. And again, 10% of the population of uh, ancient Rome have been slaves. So 90% of the population were very poor or in a bad situation. And so um, for them, it might be, have been a chance to take part in these games. And if you survive, like the chariot race, you can earn even a lot of money. The other expectation you have to consider is that the uh, average expectation of life was 25 years. So you knew um, at least uh, if you have been one of this 90% of the population who didn't have very good food. Sure, if you had very good food, like the aristocratic people, they could uh, easily be 60 or 70 years old. But most of the population died already with 25, 30, 40 years. So the consideration and the average expectation of life was very low. And that's very important because if you have this in, in mind, uh, to be poor 
and do you know that you perhaps will already die with 20 or 25 or 30 years, it's easier for you to accept to be a fighter as a gladiator because you can win a lot of and, and your life is uh, on the whole very short. Origin of the name of gladiator is coming from the military discipline. Uh, it's uh, the gladiator is coming from the weight gladius, and it's a short sword of the legionary. You see uh, here one in our exhibition. We had uh, shown in a whole, at the whole, and here you have this short sword, and this short sword gave the name of gladiator. The earliest testimonies for gladiators are uh, at the third century BC. And we know in the beginning when the testimonies begin about uh, fighting gladiators, uh, they were held during funeral games in honor of the deceased. The first uh, testimony we have uh, of, a, of a fight in 264 BC, and there are uh, three pairs of gladiators fought each other in honor to, uh, uh, of Junius Brutus in the Forum Boarum in Rome uh, because he, was, uh, he died and so for these funeral games he was honored by three pairs of gladiators. And then it's coming more and more. In 215 BC we had already um, 24 pairs fighting each other in honor for a consul. In 200, between uh, 25 pairs, and you see in 183, there were already 120 pairs of gladiators fighting. So uh, there was also in the development of these funeral games, e even more people fighting each other. But first, still always in context with somebody who died. Huh? And there we are very close to the Greek sense. Also the Greeks, when uh, if somebody, when he died and he was very important, there have been funeral games. And there you have again the link with the Greek tradition. And in this Greek tradition, when there have been uh, funeral games, there have been also these very dangerous chariot races. They are already mentioned by Homer in the Iliad and uh, Odyssey, or the boxing. So the tradition of having funeral games are also coming from the Greeks, but also from the Etruscans. And the Etruscans in their tradition had uh, as pa one part of the funeral games people who were um, condemned to death to fight against a, um, against a wild dog. And here you have one of these representations you see uh, the man who is fighting, he had over his head, he couldn't see anything, he got a, a kind of uh, tool. And uh, to fight against this wild dog, he got one club, but he couldn't see. And, the wild, uh, and, the, and he was linked with the wild dog uh, by a kind of uh, a bridle. So he had to fight and it was the question who will win. So uh, also in this tradition from the Greeks, like from the Etruscan, Etruscans, you had already very, very dangerous um, parts of the funeral games. And in this tradition, gladiators came in in the third century in Rome. In the second century BC, gladiator, gladiatorial games became so popular that a new type of architecture was created, um, the amphitheater. You put only two theaters together. But what was the advantage? You had sure much more place for spectators. And at the same time, you put the theater not to a hill, but uh, uh, outside of a hill, so you had a lot of entrances. And so you could go with this big, uh, with this bigger uh, stadiums, you call a big mass of people, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, could go very quickly into the, into the amphitheater and you could leave it very quickly. It's a system till nowadays that the arenas for football, soccer, everything had the same kind of architecture which 
comes from the amphitheater for the places where gladiator fight will have been. And the most famous and biggest amphitheater of the Roman world was built in the city of Rome between 72 and 80 by the emperors Vespasian and Titus. It later became known as the Colosseum, named uh, only after a colossal statue of the Emperor Nero, which stand nearby. So that's the origin of the Colosseum. And here you have now views of the exhibition we are showing. And uh, you have to imagine the Colosseum uh, measured um, uh, 180 to 156 meters with a height of 50 meters, so a very big building, and could accommodate at least 50,000 spectators. Some people think about 60,000 spectators. So it's like a very big arena nowadays uh, in Europe. The building was uh, erecting using uh, a kind of frame construction method, meaning that the supporting pillars and walls made of travertine were built first. Travertine was a kind of stone in Rome, uh, which was volcanic, which was very light and which could be used uh, very quickly to work on it and to put it together. And while the partic participation of the partition uh, walls and walls were added, it was already possible to start work on the story. And like this, uh, which was very important by in Roman period, they invented also this opus cementitium, a mixture of mortar and rubble, which could be added. And uh, like this, they had a kind of material which was very easy to treat and which was very, very thick and which was very consistent. And thanks to this, uh, because it became hard like a stone, you could uh, use it also for making walls, for big walls. And like for, uh, thanks to these big walls, you could make a bigger uh, architecture. And uh, the walls have been a very important part of all colosseums and all amphitheaters. Uh, in addition, uh, tough bricks and wood were used. The entire spectators' area, galleries and passage were covered with marble. So only the outside were covered very nicely then with very expensive marble. Yes, and here in a look inside in our exhibition and say you have these originals from, uh, from, from the Colosseum. And on one side we are showing some parts of the architecture to explain all parts of architecture. And uh, uh, for example here from the cellars, here from vaults, and here uh, from, uh, um, from different parts of uh, decoration of the amphitheater. And on the other side, here an impression of this very big stones belonging to the Colosseum. We have on the other side showing also that not only there have been construction parts which were very important to have an arena, but uh, for, Ro for Romans it was also very important to have a very nice amphitheater. So a lot of decorations and here we are showing different kind of decorations. There have been more than 300 uh, statues. Uh, in the Colosseum, there have been a lot of decorated pa parts of the seats and there have been also decoration everywhere. And we are showing some of these very nice decorations like here. Um, uh, so uh, it became a very uh, popular kind of game uh, for the Romans from the second century onwards. And uh, Roman politicians uh, very quickly realized that they can make a lot of advertisement for themselves if they give a lot of money to be sponsored for games. So it was very uh, interesting also for uh, politicians to have games to make themselves more known. It's like nowadays, if you give Olympic games. <laughs> Uh, winter games in Russia, you will become more famous if you don't do it. So it's the same system nowadays and also the sponsorship. The Romans had exactly the same system. 
And uh, I wanted only to show one, for example, Augustus, the first Roman emperor, he was very proud uh, about his life. And in his testimony, uh, which was published everywhere, uh, written even on stone, uh, he said what uh, he did for great things, for good things. And sure, he did uh, also organize and sponsor gladiator fights. And so he's mentioning it. Three times I organized gladiatorial games in my own name, so for advertising for himself. Five times in the name of my sons and grandsons. About 10,000 gladiators were fighting in these events. So you say you can see <laughs> how is advertising and more gladiators fighting, more you yeah, could become famous. And he is continuing to say in the same testimony, 26 times I organized fights with animals. And he's very proud, 3,500 animals were killed in these games. And it's continuing in 2 BC, he even uh, organized a naval battle between Greeks and Persians uh, on an artificial sea near the river uh, Tiber. And you have to mention, uh, so sometimes they organize not only uh, gladiators fighting each other uh, on, the, um, on the earth, but as a naval battle. And one was uh, very famous in 52. It was the Emperor Claudius who had um, organized one, uh, 19,000 uh, gladiators on ships fighting each other. And this was also a very famous um, um, gladiatorial fight because there have happened two things uh, which we know till nowadays. At this fighting, you have to imagine, it was on a, uh, it was at the Lake Fushina, which is outside of Rome, a very big lake. Uh, the, the emperor and the spectators were uh, on the earth looking at the lake. The, the battle uh, took place in a far distance. And um, to, um, and they have been they couldn't uh, hear each other very well, and therefore um, the people, the 19,000 gladiators, before beginning to fight, they said, uh, but uh, in a very loud way, so that the emperor could understand it at least a little bit. So uh, so they were saying, yes, uh, uh, greetings to you, emperor. Uh, the, um, the people are now who, who are destined, uh, their destiny will be to, 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 come, to come to death, so, will greet you. He didn't understand it very well. And so he said, that's fine. And uh, by understanding a misunderstanding, they thought the fight is over. And therefore it's only mentioning. And now if in all films you can see about gladiators, it's always coming. But it was never again used this kind of, uh, of salutation for the emperor. So it was only at this one, uh, and this was a misunderstanding, it was a disaster first. Then uh, it took uh, several uh, hours to take them again and to really let them fight. And now the next situation was they have been so far away and so when the battle was rather uh, finished, the question was what will happen to the losers? And because it was far away, the emperor made like this. And that's the same, we, uh, this, um, even now it is on Facebook, everywhere you have this kind of sign for being good or bad. Uh, but it was, that's also missed, it was only used once and it was in this naval battle. It was never again used at the gladiator fights. It's a myth. Uh, how did they decide to, uh, if somebody has to die, uh, it was in the Nazareth, it was a kind of in the Roman tradition acclamation, so people cry, uh, didn't take the thumb, but they, they said it. So they were crying, yes, he should die, or no, he shouldn't die. And yes, you see Trajan, uh, an emperor who lived about one, uh, 100 AD, he, he was very famous, he made the biggest show ever shown in the Colosseum, uh, which took uh, 123 days. And they were fighting 10,000 gladiators, gladiators in this 123 days, and uh, 11,000 animals were killed. 
And here, uh, to give you an impression on, uh, you can see here, um, which was the situation, here uh, is shown a fight between gladiators and animals, wild animals. And in the middle, you see a, a boy, and he is giving, um, he has, uh, he has uh, here the money. And it's written on each of them, 1,000 dinars. So it was a very high, uh, very high thing for the winner, and uh, it were, uh, and the organizer of this games was called Magirius, and I, uh, and now you have the translation of the text which was written here in Latin. So uh, Magirius, the sponsor of the games, Magirius, your example should be done by others. The former organizer should be ashamed. When you when and where such kind of games was given. Your games could have been in Rome, because this was in Northern Africa. Uh, you sponsored them by yourself, so he, all say he's honored. This day is your great day. Magiris is the name of the honored sponsor. That is real rich behavior. This is real power. Yes to him. After the end of the games, um, Give, uh, give the fighters more money. So he, uh, he himself made, uh, in his villa, he put in this mosaic to make advertisement for him for the next years. And that was the period. And yes, we see it nowadays also. Uh, uh, the gladiators, uh, to become a gladiator, it wasn't so easy. You had to be sure you had to, to, to be also able to be gladiator. So you had to be also really strong before. And so you, then you have been in train for two, at least two years, very often three years. And uh, so um, the gladiator schools and the um, people who organized the gladiator schools um, to entrain people for two or three years, it was also very expensive for them to educate them to be gladiator. And therefore, um, gladiators have been also considered very high and they have been expensive for having being entrained. And um, you have to imagine. Uh, so several myths. So um, in the period of Augustus, a lot of even aristocratic people wanted to be gladiator, and first it wasn't forbidden. Uh, and so also aristocratic people wanted to be gladiator, not because of the money, but because of the uh, of to being winner and to have this honor to be one of the great gladiators, because they were very high considered in society. And so uh, we know it on the contrary, because then the, um, the Emperor Augustus had to forbid that uh, aristocratic people took, paid, took, paid, uh, to, took part in to be gladiator, because so many died in several years that he didn't have enough people for ruling over, <laughs> over or, uh, to having enough politicians, because he wanted all to, always to fight. So he forbade uh, aristocratic people to take part in the gladiator games on their own. Uh, gladiators were entrained two or three years, and uh, uh, also, uh, and they had always doctors with them. They were always uh, proved if it's everything fine. And also, uh, you have to imagine um, they had also to be. Um, to have a good, uh, to have good food, but they, 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 were, they thought the best food is to be vegetarian. So, because now we found two similes of gladiators, and we could uh, analyze uh, the skeletons and also what they ate, and so uh, gladiators have been vegetarians <laughs> because they thought it's better for health. <laughs> So, also some surprising um, moments you can find if you look at gladiators. We are all telling all the stories in this exhibition. Yes, and uh, they had, uh, it depended on their discipline, they had uh, a helmet. We have here the most beautiful and most um, 
famous Hamlet of the gladiators in this exhibition. It's coming from the uh, School of Gladiators of Pompeii near Naples. It's now in the Naples in the National Museum. And also the griefs. So, so you have to imagine we have only 10, about 10 helmets in the world preserved. So that's the best one. We have about five griefs uh, preserved in the world. These are the two best ones, also from the same um, gladiator. And there are only three daggers we know of gladiators. And that's the most famous one, which is also with ivory. So it was also a very rich gladiator who was here represented. Yes, this is a very nice helmet. Yes, and also advertisement was very important also already in this period to make, uh, to focus on the fights. And for example, in Pompeii, there was fine one, uh, the gladiators of the Edel Aulus Suites will fight in Pompeii on 21st May. Also animals will be killed. Luck to all fighters of the Neroian school. Written by Secundus, the wall was prepared by Victor, added by Vespinus. So you have to imagine they went around the town, uh, prepared the walls, and then they made advertisement inscriptions. Another kind of inscription was uh, by Flaccus. On the second day, on own coast in the amphitheater, will be seen 30 pairs of athletes. 40 pairs of gladiators, animal fights with bulls, bullfighters, boars, and bears, um, bees. A second fight of animals with different wild animals will be held together with his colleague. So also there you could find a lot of advertisement. And sure, you can imagine we had a lot of fans. So they have been a fan, uh, they have been several fan clubs also, and they wrote also something on the walls. And so some here wrote, Tyro was victorious. He fought against a, th a free Thracian, and he even made a little drawing of it. And we know also of hooligans uh, at this period. Uh, it was a disaster in, the in 59 at Pompeii. Uh, the gladiators of Pompeii uh, fought against the neighbor city gladiators. And uh, it was very discussed, and people were so, uh, there have been 20,000 people in the arena, uh, spectators, and they were so angry that they fought each other. And at the end, uh, about uh, 10,000 people were hurted. And it was su such a disaster that it came to Rome, and Rome forbade for 10 years to have gladiatorial games in Pompeii. Also, a thing like nowadays. But, like nowadays, they paid a lot of money to some uh, senators and after three years they were released and they could c continue to have the games. And the animals uh, for the fighting, you have to imagine, came from everywhere of the world. So, uh, we know that some sponsors, to get very good fighting, uh, fightings and animals, they, uh, they organized people to organize them for one year to collect animals. And the, uh, and the animals are coming from Africa. They got, uh, for example, lions and different uh, wild, uh, uh, wild animals. They got tigers, elephants, and rhinoceros from India were brought to, to Rome for the fights. And uh, bears from the north. So you have to imagine a sponsor to have a very, to, to make a very good fight. He organized for one year to collect from everywhere animals coming together. And so, uh, not only gladiators and other lives end in the games. Uh, so we have, sure, we have the gladiators fighting each other. But we have also uh, people who were condemned and which uh, were condemned by to, to death and were immediately killed by wild animals and also had the chance to fight each other, but also animals fought each other. So here like, for example, a bear with a bull. And we are telling all the stories uh, in, in this <coughs> exhibition, which is continuing in several uh, rooms. And at the end of the room, 
Yes, here's also the question again with fans. Also, gladiators uh, had a lot of women liked uh, gladiators very much, and we have a lot of um, testimonies that women tried to get closer to the gladiator, paid a lot of money to have one night with him. And there have been fan articles. So you could buy uh, uh, during or after the games lamps or statues of gladiators uh, and took it with you at, uh, at home. So also this kind of system existed. Uh. And then there have been this different kind of uh, pairs of gladiators. It was not always they had not, not uh, all the same kind of armoring. There have been different kinds, and it was uh, in this way always interesting to see which might be the better one. And in this exhibition, we are not only showing the different kind of pairs, but also uh, on display you can always see the fighting. And here, for example, it's uh, a combination of a uh, retiarius. It's somebody who had, uh, who had a kind of net for throwing, and the other one had a big sword, and they had to find each other. Or here uh, we have the uh, provocator, again the provocator, so it's the same, but which are very armored, very big with shields and uh, all the things. You have to imagine it's about 25 ki kilos they had on, on their body. So it was very heavy and they have to be very well trained even to, to fight with 25 kilos on their, on their body. And here, uh, the most famous ones, it's the Mumilus against the trucks. Uh, they have been very, um, they had even griefs and the one had a sword which was uh, straight along and the other one which was inclined. And uh, they fought each other and w it was never sure who will win. Yes, and at the end of the exhibition we wanted to show uh, that life is changing. And um, here a very famous artist, Swiss artist, and he is he's famous for showing the changement of life uh, by making soaps. And she made so a, so, uh, a soap of the Colosseum. And uh, normally uh, this kind of soap is only done for Bulgari. And so we had a kind of art work, but each, uh, each visitor can take one with, with him, one of the soaps. And so the Colosseum is going more and more to ruins. <coughs> And at the end of the exhibition, probably, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, and I hope perhaps you're inspired, and perhaps you will come to Liechtenstein, small country between Switzerland and Austria. <laughs>